Namaskaram, namaskaram to all of you. Namaskaram, Sadhguru. Namaste. Sadhguru, it's a pleasure and great honor to meet you, sir, although we are meeting virtually. <laughs> a lot of things are going to be virtual for, for some time. <laughs> Sir, today you will be interacting with representatives of Indian doctors from all over the world. It is estimated that there are 1.4 million doctors of Indian origin working almost in every corner of the world. We have here Professor Anupam Sibal, who is the president of the Global Association of Physicians of Indian origin. Mm -hmm. And it has divisions, branches in 45 countries. We have here Dr. Suresh Reddy. He is the president of American Association of Physicians of Indian Origin. And we have Professor Bamra. He is the chairman of British Association of Physicians of Indian Origin. Sir, then you have me, yours truly. I am the president, but I call myself foot soldier of British Association of Physicians of Indian Origin. Thank you very much, sir. We also are delighted that we have here Dr. Pratap Reddy Garu, oh, okay. the founder of Bapio. I'm sure you have seen him several times. Sadhguru, just to start off, what is happening in the world today is unprecedented. The impact of global lockdown is unimaginable and the scare of invisible enemy is enormous. We hope to get guidance and advice from you regarding dilemmas, the hardships, the fears, the confusion amongst frontline doctors and other healthcare workers. Sadhguruji, to kick off, I'm delighted that we have amongst us our role model, Dr. Pratap Reddy. Dr. Reddy has not only transformed and modernized the healthcare in India, but he has been a friend, philosopher and guide for medical fraternity. May I request Dr. Reddy to introduce Sadhguru, who probably needs no introduction. Dr. Reddy. Pranam, sir. Sadhguru. Namaskar, Sadhguru. 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 I did not know you are the founder of API. Only today I came to know this. this no, no, Capio, Capio, Global oh. Association. Oh, okay. Physicians of India. Okay. Capi formed the year I came, I came back to India. That's very good. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a privilege for uh, that all the doctors across the world to see you. And I have known Guruji from the 90s. And uh, it has been a uh, profound experience knowing him seeing him and see the various activities that he has uh, initiated across the globe. Uh, I personally, my family enjoys uh, the experiences that we have at Disha Foundation in Asim and Belangari Hills and Pune Koyamato. I don't know how many of you have gone there, but you must. It's a tremendous <laughs> experience yet, here. And we go most often. I try to go at Sivra three times. It's unbelievable the experience. Even on the number of hundreds of thousands of people who come for the function, but it's a, an experience of its own as you enter the ashram to find the divinity in it. Mm -hmm. See Lord Shiva, uh, the Jnana Linga, and have a bath in that pond. And on the Sivra three night, each minute across the twelve hours, six a.m., six p.m. to six a.m passes on as Guruji walks in, uh, that experience that we all have there is tremendous. There are many, many things that he has done which the country and the world appreciates. You know, he has over four, five thousand full-time volunteers there. And I think 
this course has actually given me insight into how to be happy and content. I'm highly impressed, Sadhguruji, with your explanation of Vedic knowledge through modern science. My first question, therefore, comes from the course. <laughs> we had an interesting session during the course on responsibility. Sadhguru, at this difficult time for frontline healthcare workers, when they are confused, how would you guide them to handle their responsibilities to patients, to themselves, their families, and friends? Thank you. <laughs> well, uh... Namaskaram to all of you. Uh, this answer, I have to make it in such a way because those of you who have not been through the program also <laughs> should grasp this. <laughs> Otherwise, for somebody who's gone through the program, I would deal with this in a different way <laughs> The important thing is, uh, what we are misunderstanding is, as human beings, our experiences are more powerful than our actions. This is a privilege of a human being. There is a certain sensitivity of perception and experience. So what happens in our mind, in our emotions, is actually far more powerful than what we actually see and what we actually go through. Even simple mundane events can have powerful impact within us. So, for this, if this experience, whatever comes our way, because what comes our way, we cannot decide. Right now, we did not choose the virus, it's come our way. But now how we respond is in our hands. All other creatures on the planet naturally respond instinctively according to their survival instincts. It is only the human being who has the privilege that you can consciously respond to everything that comes your way. So, responsibility is this dimension of your life that you make your ability to respond into, into your conscious process so that you determine the nature of your experience, hundred percent. But action in the world is not all determined by you. It is the situation, it is the times, it is uh, other people participating and many other forces which have to cooperate for action to happen. No action in the world is all independent, no human being does a hundred percent independent action, there's no such thing, because in everything, uh, we know uh, <laughs> this is a wrong time to remind. For us to be alive itself, there are uh, many microorganisms involved. Only one is troubling us, but the rest of them are cooperating. So I'm saying action is not hundred percent ours, we have a stake, but it is not totally ours. But our experience is totally ours. This we can determine. If our experience of life is determined by us, naturally we will make it highest level of pleasantness. If your experience of life is at the highest level of pleasantness, as all of you know, there is substantial medical and scientific evidence that our body and our brains will work at their best. So if you want to… your doctors, I'm something else, somebody else is doing something else, whatever we wish to do, we must be able to harness the prowess of our body and our intelligence. Right now, whenever there are challenging situations in life, people turn against themselves, their own intelligence turns against themselves. Well, this turning our own intelligence against ourselves, a whole lot of people have given various names, exotic names are there. It starts with tension, stress, anxiety, depression and you know, they tell me today there are seventy-two medical names to describe this. But essentially, our own intelligence has turned against us. So when a situation is challenging, when a situation is against us, is this the time to turn your intelligence against you? The moment your… your ability to respond is not conscious, naturally your own intelligence, your own emotions, your own body, will turn against you. We are talking about right now, nobody has found a solution, 
for what this virus is. Everything that we are talking about is only social behavior. Our behavior, not viruses' behavior, we haven't figured what… what is its nature. Well, we don't know how long we will take to figure this out. Till now, whenever these sort of pandemics happened, it went away of its own nature. Actually, we did not find a solution in the past either. So right now, the best thing that we can do, as all of you know, is that our immune system should function at its best. This is the… this is the only real solution. Even now, it is becoming fatal only to those people who are in some… for some reason, their immune levels are a little lower than what it should be, either because of age or because of ailment or because of some other medical condition or their lifestyles or whatever it is. So immune system being at its best is the real thing. Well, we have documented this evidence, the Harvard Biz uh, Medical School has uh, documented this, that clearly it indicates that the genes that are responsible for activating and elevating the immune system, over 230 of those… Uh, the genome studies that have been done shows 230 genes are elevated for all those people who are doing simple practices called uh, inner engineering. The program that you went through is an online process, attached to that, there are practices. Uh, if you do those practices, distinctly it has been recorded that your immune system is up. Right now, that is the only solution you have for the virus. But now, apart from the virus, the problem is human thought and emotion turning against themselves and creating havoc with every individual. At least that you can immediately prevent by going through this process of engineering online, but there are attached practices, if one does that within six to eight weeks, you can definitely notice a significant uh, improvement in one's immune system. It has been well documented right now by the doctors in… Uh, in United States. So why I'm saying this is, we need to understand this. By the time we spend billions of dollars and spend months and months trying to find a vaccine, the only solution we have right now till such a thing comes up is that human immune system should be kept up. Why are we not doing the right things about that, rather than simply crying about so many things? There are problems. There are serious problems. M more than health problems, there is going to be serious economic issues for everybody in the world, particularly in India. So, when this is the situation, we have to be at our best. These are challenging times. When times that we live in are challenging for us, we must be at our best. That is why in engineering. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sadhguruji. I think what you are saying is true for uh, people all the people and all the population, the global. But those who are in front line, doctors in front line, their response and the ability converting into responsibility is going to be difficult because of the confusion that they have being in front line, whether they are going to die, what, how, what happens to their family, how they could be doing the best for their patients. So they won't have time to go through the course, because they are in front line. No, see, I wouldn't say they don't have time, because everybody has time. It is just a question of priorities. It is most important, if you are going to war, are you well prepared being most important? Front line <laughs> is a very battle uh, front term, all right? So you are in the front line means you must be ready for the battle. If you want to be ready for the battle, the fundamental thing is your competence is in place, you are strong, you are able to do what you know best. When you're paralyzed by your own fear and uh, confusions about family and emotions, your competence will go waste both for you and for the patient who… who, who depends on you. So, it is very important, especially if we realize that we are on the front line, equipping ourselves, First thing is raising our immune system and being confident that, you know, it will not come to us. There's no such thing. It can come to me, it can come to you, it can come to anybody. That is there. But fundamentally, we know clearly now that those with strong immune systems are generally not even showing symptoms. Most of the people are just passing through the infection just like that. So this is something that we must do. It is your fundamental responsibility because if large number of frontline workers fa starts falling sick, 
a whole lot of them will not report. That's the next step. Because it is one month, two months, okay, they're patriotic, they're committed and everything. Suppose this lasts for six months, twelve months and a large number of medical workers start falling sick, another part of them will not report. So when this happens, then it is in a, you know, everybody is at serious risk. Already it has happened in Mumbai, some doctors went on a few hours of strike because they are put to risk for nothing. I'm saying these things are beginning to happen. So it's very, very important the frontline workers are healthy, well, physically, mentally well, in a good condition to do a most significant job that is there on their hands right now. A doctor's profession is always an important one, but only important for sick people. Other people don't care who you are. But right now, the possibility of anybody getting sick is just hanging in everybody's face. So suddenly it's most important. In many places, everywhere in the world, in India also, though there are some negative cases also, but largely people are looking at doctors as if they're worship worthy. Doctors and nurses have become heroes for the first time. This is wonderful, this recognition is good, but it's important, heroes should be very strong within themselves, physically, mentally strong, their immune systems capable of dealing with frontline uh, offensive because probably they are most exposed to infections, the level of infection that they're exposed to may be unusually high compared to a person who travels by a plane or a train or something and gets something. What level of infection they get and what level of infection you get in hospital may be unusually high. So it's Absolutely. very, very important. Nobody should say, I don't have seventy, seventy-five minutes per day uh, in the next month to learn something which will protect me. You cannot say, I don't have enough time to put on the P, P, P or whatever and go there because you don't have the time. You cannot do that. No, that makes sense. Thank you very much. Sadhguruji, I'm going to take you to Chicago now and I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Suresh Reddy, who is the president of API, American Association of Physicians of Indian Origin. He is a Osmania Medical College graduate. Suresh is a clinical fellow interventional neuroradiologist of Harvard Medical School and is currently chairman of radiology at Heinz Medical Center, Chicago. He was awarded four times the Teacher of the Year Award by residents and students of Harvard Medical School. He makes significant contribution to the community, including educating on stroke management and prevention of childhood obesity. Suresh, go ahead. Namaskaram Sadhguruji, uh, Namaskaram. it's an honor and pleasure I am able to join you today. And uh, I met you for the first time uh, last year in Atlanta at our convention oh. and it was uh, one of my best and very enlightening moments. Thank you again for accepting to join you today. So, so I have a question only, today. The only way I would have given that award to my teachers is that they let me off from the class. <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> no, like Harvard medical students are very, very dedicated and motivated. So, thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, so, uh, there is a, there is a, two parts to this question. This is about social distancing and wearing PPE. As you know, some people in this world are not taking this seriously, whereas some are taking it extremely seriously. So a person like me who takes this seriously, it bothers me, I become anxious and my stress level goes, hits the rooftop when somebody comes to me very close without a mask, no social distancing. Yesterday, two um, uh, handymen came into my house and they were not wearing masks, they were coming very close to me and I felt very anxious. And uh, there is a second part to this question, physical proximity, like especially the families, grandparents, grandkids, mother and newborn. When your one is infected, they cannot do this hugging or kissing or physical proximity. So how do we handle these two sides of the coin? Uh, we have come to uh, times when you can only blow kisses, all right? <laughs> this is... Uh... This is a discipline we have to exercise. Well, uh, I don't know, it may not be in place, but I will try to make it brief for you. 
In the yogic traditions, always keeping physical distance has been very vital. No handshaking, no hugging, no kissing, uh, this is the only greeting we do. We do the same thing to what we think is… what we see as divine, we do the same thing to the man, woman, child, animal, tree, rock, whatever we see, this is our greeting for everyone, including the divine. At the same time, why this is so is, not uh, necessarily because we were thinking of infections, because with every contact that comes with the body, when one becomes sensitive and receptive, you want to be receptive. When you become receptive, you become receptive to everything. There is no filter, I will only receive good things, I will not receive bad things, there is no such filter. Everything goes into us in terms of memory and impact on our life. This is called as Ronanubandha, you might have heard this word from India. So the thing is, the memory imprints keep on getting complicated with more and more physical contact. So always like this, when I come to America, people ask me, Sadhguru, where is my hug? I said, I have… I have, I have it in my pocket, I will come to you tomorrow. Today, <laughs> like this. But I understand this… Uh, this thing, there are a lot of uh, very brave people. Very brave people are already dead. These reasonably brave people want to give it to you. So they are acting, they have got… They just to fulfill their compulsions, they are coming up with philosophies of freedom, rights and nonsense and all kinds of stuff. Fundamentally, they need to drink, they need to drug, they need to go to the party, they can't sit in one place, that's their problem. They don't want to address that, they want to project this as some kind of a freedom that they have to go on the streets and infect everybody. And people are talking about herd immunity, scientific words are being thrown about, thrown around by just about everybody. If herd immunity has come, as many people have said, minimum sixty to eighty… anywhere between sixty to eighty percent of the population has to be infected. This means we will literally wipe out our geriatric population and also affect children below one year… one year of age and also all those vulnerable population, we may take them out. And that will amount to millions and millions of people on the planet. This herd immunity, what people are talking, is quite an irresponsible thing because that will inevitably happen at a later time, some point. But this is not something that you work towards because in the process, the number of lives lost is not going to be simple. So this level of irresponsibility is because one thing is ignorance, another thing is today anybody can put up whatever they want on the social media, everybody running their own campaign, how this virus itself is fake, it doesn't exist. You know, to that extent it's going, a lot of voices from America are saying, it doesn't actually exist, they're just making it up, it's somebody's conspiracy. So that is because they want to have a haircut, they want to go to the bar, this is the real thing. So for this they're making up all this, this is… this is a time when how responsibly you behave. By simply not doing anything, you can serve the world. These are rare times, you know, <laughs> for those lazy people. If you don't do anything, you will serve your nation and your… and the world and humanity in a huge way. At least that much they must do. If they can't take up some important work and do it, at least that much they must do. They must keep themselves to themselves. But unfortunately, they are not doing that. I understand the concern because it's everywhere. Uh, in United States, it's showing up on the streets in a big way. But in India also, there is a segment of people who believe their God will take care of them, they don't need to follow any rules. Well, God may not take care, may take you, that is the whole thing. The whole thing is not to be taken by God, that is the important thing about life <laughs> That is why the mask, that is why the social distancing behavior, all this. Unfortunately, even in a time like this, as a generation of people, when we have the highest capability to communicate to every human being on the planet in terms of social media, in terms of internet and everything, in spite of that, at a time like this, so easily you can misinform people is a terrible thing, but unfortunately it's happening. We would assume compared to previous pandemics like the Spanish flu, whatever, when there was no communication, whatever your neighbor said was the truth, you are always confused about what it is, but today we thought very easily you can put out the medical facts and say this is it. But unfortunately, look at this, how it is happening. It doesn't matter what technological tools we have, till we transform individual human beings, 
this is how it's going to be. Technology doesn't really solve the problem, it is only complicating the problem. Thank you, Guruji. And uh, I have another smaller question. There is uh, this suffering about these migrant workers, and every time I see them, it's like so heartbreaking. Uh, how to cope up with that kind of anxiety and uh, there's so much suffering going on. And also I have another request. In the last week of June, we are doing a worldwide uh, COVID uh, medical summit and I would like you to come for a few minutes and bless us. Thank you. About the migrant workers, uh, I, I'm not uh, trying to play it down, definitely it is happening. But we need to understand if the government did not bring uh, the lockdown suddenly without informing people, it would not have worked because people would have moved in a big way. So they had to bring it down, they, it has to be like a surprise element that it had to just come in like that so that people stay where they are. But initially we thought it's fifteen days, we thought people will manage, somehow we will provide food and do things which… for which ma massive efforts have been made, but the numbers are so huge. But at the same time, this concern about migrant workers right now is simply because cameras are on them for the first time. These people who are walking just with a bag, which is their whole possession, a child and a bag is the entire possessions of their life. So you must understand how they were living in the city. Their life in the city was not any better than this walk on the highway. I want you to understand it's that bad. So nobody saw that because no cameras went there. Now suddenly cameras are there. There is also a, a problem because the extension of uh, this lockdown kept on increasing according to the needs, every time they're studying the situation and going on increasing, a certain panic spread and there are also people spreading that panic. There are… there are people who are actually actively… actively want to see a crisis evolve in the country those people are also there, creating fear among those people. See, right now the best thing even for the migrant worker would be just to stay put where he is. That would be the best thing. Over eighty-five percent of India's COVID uh, cases are only in thirteen cities. And from these cities, people are going all over the country back to their villages, which is a terrible thing to do right now. But for political reasons and uh, for whatever, some people like some people have fun seeing a crisis, that's the whole problem. People created so much fear and now they want to go back to their villages. When they go back to their villages, are they going to leave the virus in the train and go? They're going to take it to their families. People who are completely safe in the village, you're taking the virus to them, but now you can't stop them, it's such become such an emotional issue. See, you being in Chicago, you have also seen those terrible images of people suffering and it moves your heart. It moves everybody's heart, but right now is not a time to go by our emotional responses. This is a time to do the right thing, so that this doesn't become uh, across the population and everybody's suffering. We must limit it. That is the only thing we can do. We don't have a solution for the virus. Only solution we have is, fortunately, the virus chooses us as a mode of transport. All we have to do is just stay in one place, no matter what. Whatever our emotions are, whatever our situation is, just stay in one place. If this discipline the entire world, without a single person breaking it, if you do it for fifteen days, it's gone. Am I right, sir? I'm asking you yes, as, as medical so opinion. Much that much you we must do. You are perfectly correct, you are perfectly correct. So, Again, I would like to request you to come for a few minutes and bless our global summit happening in the last week of June. Thank you, Guruji. Uh, it's an honor and my… Uh, I am uh, humbled and also I am blessed to have these few minutes with you. Thank you. Thank you, Suresh. Um, so, Guruji, uh, thank you very much. Your um, point about herd immunity is very, very interesting and I hope uh, people, responsible people, listen to that. I think that's very important. I'm now going to take you, sir, virtually to hot Delhi. We have Professor Anupam Sibbal there. He is the president of Global Association of Physicians of Indian Origin, which was founded by Dr. Pratap Reddy and myself long ago. Anupam is the group medical director of Apollo Hospitals. 
is a consultant gastroenterologist and hepatologist. He has helped set up the first successful pediatric liver transplant program in India in 98 at Apollo Hospitals. This transplant program is the busiest solid organ transplant program in the world since 2012. He has 122 publications. He has delivered 136 international lectures. Anupam, you can't compare with Guruji's lectures. <laughs> um, he has 229 national lectures. And he has edited a textbook in pediatric gastroenterology and hepatology. He is also author of a national bestseller, Is Your Child Ready to Face the World? With that introduction, Anupam, stage is yours. Uh, Sadhguruji, uh, Namaskaram. 17 years ago, I had the privilege of welcoming you to Apollo Hospital Delhi when you oh. agreed to address the Apollo family. And for our family members, it was a life changing experience. And 17 years later, I've got this opportunity. So I'm most, most grateful for this. Um, on April 11th, uh, with the guidance of, of Dr. Reddy, and stalwarts across the globe, we established a Global Indian Physicians Collaborative Against COVID-19. And in the last six and a half weeks, Sadhguruji, we've interacted with thousands of doctors across the world of Indian origin. And I want to uh, request you to answer a question based on what is uppermost on their mind, and that's about pressure. Um, COVID-19 has put doctors under immense pressure. Pressure as clinicians to provide the best care in a scenario where we are still to identify the agent or agents that can effectively treat the disease. We are dealing with a disease where there is so much that is not understood and that as clinicians makes us uneasy. And there is this constant need to update knowledge and we are constantly studying, reviewing, sitting up at night. And, and Sadhguruji, just to give you one example, as of 5 p.m. today on PubMed, where all the peer-reviewed papers are published, in 129 days since COVID-19 was first described, there are 16,610 published papers. That means 128 papers a day. As new evidence emerges, what was a recommendation yesterday now changes. We are doing our best, but that best is sometimes not good enough. And we are just not used to that. Spending hours in PPEs, days away from the family is not easy. Then there is this worry of bringing the virus home. And we can't even share our worries with our families because they're worried sick anyway. The community wants reassurance and every friend, every relative you speak with wants to hear these magic words. It will end soon. But as doctors, we have no clear idea when this will end. When will we have a cure? When will we have an effective vaccine? We are seeking answers, uh, Sadhguruji, ourselves to question that we as healthcare leaders are supposed to provide. We usually have answers, but not this time. Not yet. Sadhguruji, please advise us on how to handle this pressure. Uh, in a way, uh, when the first question, I kind of uh, put this on, uh, uh, you know, I kind of put this out. But uh, to answer this question pointedly, there is a situation. A situation that as you admit, as I admit, as everybody is admitting slowly, that we don't know how to handle. The only thing we are trying to do is control human behavior, hoping that we can slow it down. And we have also realized we are not able to control human behavior either totally. If you could control that totally, probably in two weeks time, in a fortnight, it would be gone. But we are not able to control that because there are a whole lot of human beings who are still evolving. <laughs> you cannot tell them anything sensible. <laughs> they will take their own time to understand and uh, we don't know how many lives have to go before they understand. So pressure is there. But isn't it important when challenging situations arise in our life, that we must become the best possible human beings that we can be. In terms of competence, in terms of our humanity, in terms of our efficiency, in terms of a larger vision for everything that we are doing, 
isn't this the time to become that, rather than being pressured? Whenever ugly things happen to us, there are two ways. One is we can get wounded, another is we can get wise. These are the only two options we have. Unfortunately, a whole lot of people get wounded. No, we should become wise, difficult situations should make us wise, not wounded. So especially if doctors start breaking down mentally, which can happen because months of non-stop work and as you said, distance from the family and your own fear of infection to yourself and above all, if you have a family that fear of infecting them, even one visit can happen, you know, all these issues are there, it's not simple. I am not trying to simplify the situation. It is very, very challenging situation. Like never before for this generation of people, in my opinion. People think it's not. some people think it's nothing. But when I look at the many ramifications of what could happen in the next six to eight months, it's like never before for this generation of people. Since 1960, I don't think we have faced this sort of a situation. This is not just a medical situation, this is a social situation, this is an economic situation, this is a geopolitical situation. There are too many things involved, too many things playing out right now. So, there is definitely pressure on everybody, particularly the medical forces because they are right there. But the pressure is there on economic forces, people who are la running large institutions, industry, there is enormous pressure, you know. The pressure may be different for them, it's different for you, but there is pressure on everybody and it will further increase. It will further increase in the next month. Hopefully, everybody is hoping in the next two, three months it'll ease off, but we don't know. Even I have a gut feeling by September things should have eased off, but there is no data to support that gut feeling. There's really no data to tell us by September it'll be better. At least in India we are thinking by October, August, September, things should be better. But in the Western countries, especially in the United States, they are saying uh, October, November, December is going to be second wave and it's going to be way bigger than what it is right now. United States has crossed hundred thousand. It is like uh, going ahead of every other nation, all right, in terms of fatalities. No other nation has that many fatalities, it's gone ahead. Well, why is it that the most affluent country in the world is going through this is simply because one dimension of it is when people live in a certain level of comfort, their ability to handle pressure is gone. Unfortunately, comfort does this to people. Those who are out there every day battling their life in some way, they have more capability to handle this. Just uh, well, uh, Dr. Reddy from Chicago mentioned about the migrant labor. Yes, there is suffering where there is no food, but where there is food supply and things are taken care of, people are walking stoically. They are not really suffering because every day they go to work like that, every day they live like that. They may not be joyful about it, but there is a certain sense of, you know, a strength that they are going with. I am not trying to belittle their problem, the problem is huge. Nourishment issues have come, serious issues. Even here around us, we, every day we are feeding thousands of people. I never imagined in remote uh, rural Tamil Nadu, there'll be so many people who won't have food to eat if they don't work for two weeks. Thousands of people every day, we are… our volunteers are out feeding them. And millions of people like this are being fed across the country. But the important thing is, right now we need to be at our best. When we need to be at our best, if we collapse within ourselves, this is going to be terrible for us. And above all, in your profession, the world depends on you right now. When they are not well and when there is a possibility of not being well, they depend on you. Please do not crumble under pressure. This is why we offered Inner Engineering Online free of cost to every medical professional. If they are working in a hospital, whatever level of work, we said it's free for all of them. Please make use of the tools I'm telling you. The simple tool is just this. Right now, uh, all of you as medical professionals, kn professionals know this, human experience has a chemical basis to it. What you call as joy, 
what you call as misery, what you call as anxiety, what you call as tranquility, what is agony, what is ecstasy, everything has a chemical basis to it. The Harvard Medical School has done this study, the cannab uh, cannabinoids in the uh, system are all elevated simply because of a yogic practice. The inner engineering practices have raised this in such a way, the mood levels are so high, what I am talking about is, that you create a chemistry of blissfulness within you. This is not just now because of the virus. If anybody thinks what they are doing is important, the most important thing is they must work upon themselves. If you think you are delivering something important, is it not important that you must be at your best? What does being best mean? It is not just physical strength. Being at my best means I am always in a place where situations will not cause suffering to me. This is very important for a doctor, that situation will not cause suffering to me. I decide how I am within myself. This is the ability which we wish to offer to the medical professionals through inner engineering program. There are practice attached to it. Nobody should say you don't have time. This is as good as saying I don't have time to put on my PPE. That is dangerous. It is very important because if you crumble under pressure, the world will crumble. Please don't do that. Thank exactly. you. Thank you so much, Sadhguruji, for this beautiful message that we have to become the best of who we can be. Thank you. Thanks, Anupam. Sadhguru, now I'm going to take you from hot Delhi to rainy Manchester virtually. <laughs> so we have uh, Professor J.S. Bamra. He is the chairman of British Association of Physicians of Indian Origin, BAPIO. Uh, he is uh, normally known as JS, and JS is a senior consultant psychiatrist at the Greater Manchester Mental Health Trust, and he is an honorary reader at University of Manchester. He is a trustee of two charitable organizations. One is for disadvantaged people from South Asian community, and the other for African Caribbean Mental Health Service. He is Deputy Chairman of the Board of Science for BMA. He is inventor of a smartphone app called Chart My Health, which is currently undergoing development. JS, JS is part of two year Health Education England West Bengal project, which aims to transform how mental health nursing care is delivered in key, key institutions in West Bengal. JS is a science man. He says he doesn't believe in spirituality. So hopefully you can get him right, Sadhguruji. JS, go on. Namaskaram, Satsekar. Namaskaram. <laughs> and that is not strictly true. You know, any, any psychiatrist will know that there is power in, uh, in the mind that cannot be explained by science. I'm a, I'm a man of science, but it's a rare pleasure, Sadhguruji. Uh, and I, since I came to know this, I've been looking at what you've done, which is a tremendous amount, much more than doctors do. And I'm meeting today a man of great wisdom, philosophy and philanthropy. You've done such a huge amount oh. in your own time, charitable causes that we don't do and spirituality, of course. So we know now that COVID-19 is the mother of all pandemics. And we can predict that the Great Depression of the 1930s will be dwarfed by the economical and psychological crisis that is to come. So my question is generalized. It's around medical people, but it's much broader than that, because the challenges of our future generations are going to be both psychological and ecological, and I reckon you're a specialist in both. So how do we break the barriers of stigma or mental illness? and the ignorance of global warming. You'll hear about prominent political people ignoring completely the global signs. How do you think the post-COVID world will unfold? And what can we as a person, what can I do? What can the individual do? See, before we look at the post-COVID world, because <laughs> we don't know when this virus will allow you to be post, <laughs> when you… <laughs> when it will allow you to treat it as history, all right, the, we still don't know. So I think it's very important we look at the pre-COVID world, how we have been living. 
Well, if I have to... I mean, these are not things that you're not aware of, but let me put this into some kind of perspective. Every day, nearly eight thousand children die because of malnourishment. That is about nearly three million children below five years of age dying in the world every year. To feed about eight hundred and twenty million people who are daily on a... Uh, daily go to bed on a hungry stomach, it would take only something like uh, nine point seven to nine point eight billion dollars. But uh, that is uh, in a year. But we just have video games. The revenue on video games is over hundred billion dollars in the world. And uh, daily, uh, you know, the alcohol and tobacco and drugs put together is nearly as much as money that we spend on food. Three point seven trillion dollar is the agriculture produce on the planet. Three point two trillion is what is spent on alcohol, tobacco and, uh, you know, psychedelic drugs. So, when this is how we've been living, well, the virus has brought stop to this and the moment they open up the liquor vans in India, <laughs> in Tamil Nadu in a single day on 8th of May, the day they opened the liquor vans, one day's sales is 170 crores. So, nearly uh, thirty percent of the most of the states in India, their revenue is coming from liquor. So all the states are pitching, chief minister saying, first let's open the liquor vans because we don't have money. So if this is how we are living, then uh, post-COVID we can... we should think later. We must fix the pre-COVID the way we've been living. What happened in 1930, if it is a consequence of World War I and followed up by the Spanish flu, which took nearly fifty million people off. Fortunately, this virus is not that virulent, it's a little kind to us. If we behave responsibly, it will not touch us or it will not bother us too much. That virus, the influenza virus of uh, 1918 was a different kind, it just killed people just like that and in uh, most of the people who died were between twenty and forty. Here, most of the people are over seventy-five, eighty in that range. So, it is much gentler on us, <laughs> let me have to admit that. And our economies, our technologies, our ability to transmit things is at a... another level, okay? You couldn't have imagined in early twentieth century that all these things would be available. That day you were fighting virus without even having an antibiotic on your hands. Today the amount of uh, pharmaceutical formula... formulations you have, your ability to transport things, your ability to reach people, is another world, you cannot even compare that world and this world, it's a totally different world. Having said this, right now our fear is of economy, definitely it's a serious thing. In India, in the last twenty years, we've pulled out over two hundred and forty million people from below poverty line to above poverty line. Above poverty line is not a great place, but it's a better place. But if this virus situation doesn't get sorted out by September, October at least, if it continues for six to eight months or twelve months, then we will be pushing these two and forty million people back below poverty line for sure. So that is the real issue, that is the real problem. Right now there are eight hundred twenty million people who are going hungry, that number may double. People are estimating up to three billion people may go hungry in the world. That's a real disaster. These are the things that we must be concerned about. At the same time, the amount of resources we have is like never before. As I said, we are playing video games for hundred billion dollars. For ten years, we can feel all the... feed all the hun hungry people. If we just stop this one thing, if you save our thumbs, you know, <laughs> I'm saying the resources are also like that. We are drinking and smoking away 3.2 trillion dollars worth of resource. Well, we could transform that into something else. Will we do it or not is another question. But I'm saying, we have... we are resource rich like never before. We are technology rich like never before. We are competence and science and rich and knowledge rich like never before. Now if we can't solve the problem, uh, I think uh, this will be a very harsh thing to say, but in some ways, 
we have asked for it, we deserve it. Because don't look at the post-COVID world, please look at the pre-COVID world, how have we been living? Is it a sensible human way of living? I'm not trying to com comment on people's lifestyles, it's for them to decide. But at the same time, when the crisis comes, you must be able to transform. All right, you were playing video games six hours a day, now there is a crisis, now you can transform. All right, you're spending half your life in the bar, now a crisis has come, you should be able to transform. Because my problem is not about what you do or you do not do. As a human being, you must live consciously. We need to create a conscious humanity, a conscious planet. Because m minus consciousness, we are nothing. We are not even as good as other animals because at least they are eco-friendly. We are not even that. The only big thing about us is, we go beyond our natural instincts, basic instincts of survival and we can function consciously. This is the big thing about being a human being. If we surrender that, then what is left, what is valuable about human life? We are not uh, in any way valuable, ants and insects and birds are far more valuable to nature than us. We are valuable only because of our, abil of our ability to be conscious. Once we surrender that, there is really no value to human existence. This is something that we must realize at this time. And if we realize this as a humanity, I don't know how much hardship should come, how many lives should go before we realize this, but if we realize this, it doesn't matter where the economy is, if humanity realizes, that our ability to be conscious, our ability to go beyond our compulsive nature is the highest value of being human, then the post-COVID world is a fantastic world. If we don't realize that, all we will have is many people wiped out, many people ruined, hungry, suffering, poverty, enormous poverty across the world, this is what we will see. So. It is very important that now there is a lockdown and anyway most people don't have work, it's important that we see how we've been living in the last fifty years. In the last fifty years, seventy percent of the vertebrate population on the planet has been wiped out. Eighty percent of the bio you know, biomass in the world is gone. What is our plan for this world? When we are living so wantonly, so insensitively, so unconsciously, post-virus is not the thing we must look at, pre-virus is what we need to look at. So on that uh, same theme, sorry Ramesh, just on this, what are the three top tips that we've learned pre-COVID that we need to translate into post-COVID that will change the world for us? Well, uh, essentially we've been living unconsciously, compulsively. Compulsiveness is ruling our way of life. If we become conscious in our existence, as individual people, as societies, as nations, and as humanity, if we function at least ten percent more consciously than the way we are functioning right now, post-COVID will be a fantastic world. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's a great message, yes. Human being Indeed. must live consciously. Sadhguru, uh, thank you very much for that. Is for you personally, sir, and uh, I hope you don't mind. Uh, Dr. Pratap already mentioned that you are a mystic, <laughs> and I'm mystified with that word. That word, what is mystic? So, could you please tell us what's the meaning of mystic? And may I also ask you, where did you acquire all this immense knowledge? You know, as doctors, we've been reading books and books and books. And our knowledge is minuscule in front of what you have. So, what's the secret? <laughs> uh, the secret is uh, I've been living on this planet for uh, over six, <laughs> six decades and keeping everything open, <laughs> not making any conclusions about anything. About mystic, well, uh, this is a label that you get when you perceive everything just the way it is, that you don't make up anything. You don't have a philosophy, you don't have an ideology, and you have not read scriptures, you don't ascribe to any religion, you're just there just as life, as life should be. And unfortunately, people slap this ta tag on you that you're a mystic because they are mistakes. <laughs> 
mistakes of scriptures, mistakes of religion, mistakes of philosophies, mistakes of ideologies, mistakes of identities with family, nationality, community, because of all these mistakes they have done, they call me a mystic <laughs> and, and, and how do you get all this knowledge? Do you read a lot of books? Do you listen to uh, podcasts? Or... <laughs> no. Don't I look… don't I look uneducated enough, sir <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank Sadhguruji. Uh, that's very kind. So, I'm going to go to uh, Delhi again. And um, Anupam, would you want to ask a brief question and then if there is time, we'll go to JS. Uh, Sadhguruji, um, COVID-19 has changed our approach to life. Uh, Dr. Reddy wrote a beautiful editorial in Hindu talking about what all we've learned. And, and I'm quoting from that, we've discovered the power of stillness, the beauty of spending time at home with friends. There is now a growing realization that our needs are limited and can be met. But that race that we were running in pursuit of wants would never have ended. This reality has now dawned on us. We've made ourselves slaves to this culture of wants. Sadhguruji, how can we ensure that we hold on to this beautiful awakening when COVID ends? Uh, it once happened that uh, a gypsy these days you don't see them, but uh, they… you know, when we were growing up, you would see gypsies coming and camping in our towns. A gypsy man scolding his young son, you good-for-nothing fellow, if you don't learn some juggling and some thievery and whatever is needed to survive, I will put you to school and make you an educated man, then you will suffer… suffer with endless want. Unfortunately, that is the kind of education we've delivered to the world. All that it does to human beings is endless want. Education means it should have widened our horizon so much, we should have become free from our wants. This is education for me, that as you become more evolved, your wants should go. But right now, it is only the educated people who are really destroying this planet. The illiterate have very small footprint. They are very eco-friendly people, illiterate people. So the moment you go to this sort of education, I'm sorry, sir, you're from Manchester, JS, uh, <laughs> the Manchester style of mass production education, you know, put everybody through the same works, they will become hungry for more and more and more, not more in terms of expansion of who they are, more accumulations, endless accumulations, nobody knows why they're shopping. All right? They don't even know why they're shopping, what they're shopping. They turn their homes into warehouses and it's going on and this is our idea of economy. Our idea of economy is destruction. I was asked to speak, uh, you know, when I was at the economic forum, in uh, 2008 there was a little bit of a… not little bit, quite a significant depression. All these multi-billionaires were all sad because they were few billions less than what they were a uh, few months before that. So they asked me to handle a session, recession and depression. I said, see, right now the way you have built the economic engine, if it fails, you will get depressed. If it succeeds, all of us will be damned. So you must choose whether you want… To, you want the world to be damned or you should be depressed. This is all the choice you have created. So this is the value systems we have created. I must tell you this because uh, Dr. Reddy is there, uh, Pratap Reddy Garu is there, and in Tamil Nadu you still see this, it's going away rapidly, but you still see this to some extent. Suppose you go to your function, you go to your wedding, outside uh, cars are parked, Mercedes, Bentley, this one, that one, TVS, moped, all kinds of things are parked. Inside if you go, if you look at the ladies, maybe you will be able to make out, uh, you know, looking at the amount of gold around their neck, if it's kilograms by kilograms, you can say they're rich or poor. But if you look at the male population inside, they will all be sitting there, all of them will be in just that white bushard, starched and ironed, and white dhoti. You can't make out who came in the Bentley, who came in the TVS moped, they're all same. So this kind of value system was there in our country that what is valued is how responsible you are, 
how uh, generous you are, how inclusive you are, these things were valued, your humanity was valued more than anything. Today in Delhi, sir, you are asking from Delhi, so I'm saying in Delhi, first thing they ask you is how much are you worth? How many crores are you worth? Everything is based on that. Today if you say somebody is a big man, is it because he has a very big brain? Or because he's got a very big heart? No, he's got a very big pocket, so he's a big man. When we set values like this, obviously this is the direction you will go. And now, people are sitting at home and twiddling their thumbs with all their money. Every time there is a little problem in the country, I know a whole lot of people who will go off to Spain and Italy. Now, these are the two countries you can't go to <laughs> I'm not trying to enjoy their problems. All I'm saying is, you can go anywhere, you can live the way you want. Your lifestyles are your business, I'm not the sort of person to com you know, comment about anybody's lifestyle. But it should not be compulsive. That is what is important. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sadhguruji. Uh, I'm told that this was the last question. So, JS, sorry, uh, your fears have come true. You have no time for any more questions. I can, I can just say one thing, if I may, Ramesh. I want to give Sadhguruji a new label. He's yes. a scientific mystic because <laughs> the way he's answered our questions, yes. there's a lot of science behind it. Really? And there should be consciousness. I'm going to take that with me. What he said is absolutely true. Thank you I, very much. I want, uh, I want all of you who are in the medical profession to understand that uh, what you're doing is not a job. This is not just another job. At a time like this, this is the most significant thing. Well, all of us have our roles to play, but your role determines whether somebody lives or dies. So when that privilege is given to you, in a way you are an extension of uh, Creator's hand, please uh, use this hand responsibly and please you should not crumble under this pressure. This is a time that you must stand up as really wonderful and strong human beings. Whatever support that is needed from our end, I'm willing to offer time and energies to make this happen for the medical professionals. Please, uh, uh, sir, you, you must not say that you don't have time for inner engineering. All of you <laughs> must do it because you being well determines the wellness of this world right now. Please do your best. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you, very much. Thank you so much. And the message I'm taking is all human beings have to behave consciously. You've been absolutely brilliant. Thank you for sparing an hour or just over an hour with us. And hopefully, we should be able to do it again. And I must thank our Dr. Pratap Reddy Garu. Thank you. Uh, in spite of, I know, constraints on your everything time, you spend uh, time with us. So, and my panelists, thank you very much. In the background, a lot of people have been working from the ashram. So, I thank everybody who have contributed to this wonderful event. Namaskaram. Thank you. Namaskaram.